This week on the podcast, First Nations people say not our king, and the National Tertiary Education Union votes to implement BDS on Israel. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis, and I'm talking to you from Gadigal Country in Sydney. And I'm Riley Green. I'm joining you from the land of the Wadjuk Noongar in Bulu, Perth. And today we've got a great interview coming up later on the podcast with Mark ha- Markella Panagyris, who is a activist uh, and member of the National Tertiary Education Union National Council. And she's going to be talking to us about the recent vote to implement an academic institutional boycott of Israel, uh, as well as some other really important votes. Um, so we're going to be talking to Markella later on the show. Um, but first up, we're going to be talking about the so-called King's recent visit to uh, this country um, and the, some of the responses from First Nations activists uh, in uh, Gadigal Country, Sydney and Ngunnawal, Canberra. But before we get started, we'd just like to mention that we are recording on stolen land that always was and always will be Aboriginal land. This land was never ceded and was taken by force and Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for justice, sovereignty and land rights. Uh, Also, before we get started, I'll just mention that you can help us out by becoming a supporter at greenleft.org.au. It's only $5 a month and it makes a massive difference to help us continue. And it's also the best way to make sure you get all of our content. Um, So on with the show, we'll start off with what was kind of the biggest news story out of this um, uh, visit from uh, so-called King Charles, uh, which sparked protests, um, First Nations activists and supporters. But uh, most of you at home will have seen the video that went viral of uh, Senator uh, Gunai Gunjitmara and Jabberung Senator Linnea Thorpe. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen it, I, I recommend going to her Instagram or whatever else and having a look because it's it's actually it's really good. Well, maybe what we'll do actually we'll put it up in the video here and people can can see it. Um, so we'll just play that clip now. <laughs> So that was Lydia Thorpe speaking uh, at Parliament House while well, calling out um, the King, uh, King Charles at an event at Parliament House. And that video and uh, the kind of protest around it received massive uh, media attention around the world. It went viral on social media and it drew, you know, the kind of expected frenzy from the corporate media and the right wing media. Um, Which is exactly, you know, I, I have full respect to Lydia. It's exactly what she wanted. You know, when the when the likes of, you know, uh, I don't know what the East Coast equivalent of the West Australian or, you know, the Murdoch press is ragging you out, you know, you're doing something right. Um, so, yeah, 100%. Well, well, people kind of talk about it or try and criticize it as, oh, it's just a stunt. Like, it's just to get uh, attention and stuff like that. Um, but in a way, you know, that's... It, is kind of the point it's draw it's drawn massive attention to the fact that you know we're still living under a monarchy with uh, unelected uh birthright superiors who rule over us from uh, across the sea and pointed out the important fact that you know this is first nations land and that the you know british crown um were the ones behind, responsible for uh colonizing uh, Australia uh, 200 years ago, which is obviously still an ongoing uh, process. Yeah. And, you know, even though the crown probably doesn't play a massive role today, um, there's still a lot of historical um, reparations and justice that needs to be served. Um, yeah, and I, I think, um, like, just, just doing, you know, having, you know, this pompous kind of parade around visiting Canberra, visiting Parliament, whatever else it you know the the point of that for the monarchy is to legitimize itself uh and mm. for that to go unchallenged would you know would just mean that 
we're just conceding to the legitimacy of monarchy. So what, what Lydia did was actually quite important in that, um, in that it, it challenges that their, their legitimacy reminds everyone actually, you know, why the, why the hell are we actually, you know, going along with this? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it really draws a sharp distinction of like what, what is going on that why are these basically two random people who don't really have any connection to Australia, uh, as a, you know, as a country, a so-called country or as a land, um, and the people, why are we parading them around in these fancy outfits and, and, you know, putting them up on a stage and, and listening to what they have to say, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so what Lydia Thorpe said, uh, after well, basically she, as you see in the video, she got like escorted out of the, um, parliamentary reception. Um, and she said, Today I was silenced and removed from the parliamentary reception when pointing out that the crown stole from First Peoples. She said the visit by the so-called king should be an occasion of truth-telling about the true history of this country. And the truth is this colony is built on stolen land, stolen wealth and stolen lives. And I think, you know, it's that's a message that I guess people listening to this podcast, people who are engaged in activism or uh, interested in kind of concepts like social justice or socialism or anything along these lines. Most of the yeah, people I who doubt are, it's controversial to yeah, this thing, but. but it's gone way beyond that to people who, uh, first of all, people in Australia who don't have enough of a kind of understanding of the, of the truth of, of Australia's kind of history and past, uh, and also things that are happening currently, but also it's gone international and people in countries around the world who don't have the context have been able to see this and i think that's been quite important i know it was there was uh, act, uh first nations activists in canada who responded and found it quite like inspiring to see Di kind of a direct confrontation with the uh, uh the british crown um so that was so that's had a big impact i think but it's it's not just lydia Thorpe, who has um, been protesting. Uh, there's also been a variety of, you know, various grassroots groups and First Nations activists who have taken action. So um, what Lydia was doing when she uh, made that uh, statement was trying to hand uh, Charles a, an international criminal court notice uh, of complicity in First Nations people's genocide. Um, so that was her official kind of what she was trying to do. But, uh, another activist who was, who was attempting to do that was, uh, uncle Wayne Coco Wharton. He is a king of thieves and a king of liars. You have the blood on your hands of invasion. Who's from the Aboriginal sovereign embassy and, uh, Lana Stoker. So they were arrested on October 21, which is the same day at the war memorial in, in Gunnawal, Canberra for they had a, another peaceful protest to unwelcome the king and they were trying to hand over that icc notice um, i like that um just a side I, I quite like that idea of unwelcome you know because obviously we have the welcome to country and so on but specifically mm. unwelcoming saying you know not only are we not going to give you the welcome to country but actually you are specifically and individually not welcome here i, I really like that phrasing yeah, and on that note what uncle Coco said was that he had been instructed to come here with the permission of the Ngunnawal people. So, um, respecting, you know, the, the traditional owners and the uh, sovereigns of the land, unlike, you know, King Charles. So here in, um, so basically the King and his entourage, whatever, whatever it's uh, called have been to Canberra and also to Gadigal country, Sydney. Um, and so what activists here have done, including Uncle Coco has helped uh, establish it. They've established a peaceful protest camp in Victoria pa Park, which is uh, in, the, in the city. And that was established on October 18. Um, and there's, you know, Aboriginal flags, Palestinian flags, West Papua flags, and representatives of different, uh, you know, groups, including uh, from Kanaki. So activists there are chanting, you know, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, not our king. And they've also got banners, uh, a few of them. One of them says, 
empire built on genocide. Another one says decolonize. Um, so there's this kind of, uh, you know, sovereignty uh, camp that's been set up. I know there's a similar uh, thing, camp sovereignty has been set up uh, going for months in, um, in Nam, Melbourne. Uh, but this is a, a first in, in Sydney. And it's in a quite an a, uh, a important space, that, that Victoria Park. It's also where, uh, at the end of the Invasion Day rallies here in, um, in Sydney every year, there's a, um, markets, important markets that uh, the march always marches to um, in that same space. So it's become a kind of an important space for, uh, for these kind of actions. It's actually right next, right near um, the University of Sydney. So hopefully some students are able to get down and support that. Can people check out the, the article that we've got uh, on Green Left website on this? Um, and I think, you know, this camp is still ongoing at this, at the moment as of we're recording. So it will be, uh, you know, interesting to see how things develop, if they face any kind of police repression and things like that. Um, but I thought we could end on these words from Lydia Thorpe. Uh, which is that the British Crown committed heinous crimes against the first peoples of this country. These crimes include war crimes, crimes against humanity, and failure to prevent genocide. There has been no justice for these crimes, and the Crown must be held accountable. So as Israel ramped up its genocide in Gaza, including denying an estimated 400,000 people access to food and water and continuing its assault on Lebanon, activists here have been looking at ways to step up our Palestine solidarity campaigning. News that Australia provided support to US B-2 stealth bombers to strike Houthi resistance fighters in Yemen on October 17 is more proof that this country is complicit in the ongoing genocide. The union movement is, of course, a, a vital field where many rank and file activists have been pushing for more action to support Palestine, but there's been less action taken from union leadership. On the other hand, the, uh, the National Tertiary Education Union, the Union for University Work Workers and Academics, has overwhelmingly voted to support an academic institutional boycott of Israeli universities at its recent National Council meeting held over October 3rd to 5th. To discuss this, we are joined by NTU National Councillor and Social Science member, Markella Panagiris. Uh, welcome back to the podcast, Markella. Thanks, Riley. Thanks. It's good to be here again. Um, so before this, this meeting that's happened recently, what kind of steps has the NTU taken in response to Israel's ongoing genocide on Gaza uh, in the lead up? And I guess by that I mean both both the rank and file union um, activist membership and also the broader union itself and its bureaucracy and so on? Yeah, so from the rank and file members, of which I'm one, um, since the 7th of October last year, we have done a lot of work trying to figure out what we can do in our union to show solidarity with Palestine. <clears throat> and we have formed a group of rank and file members of the NTU called NTEU for Palestine. And over the last, you know, at least 10 months, we've been working towards um, trying to get the NTU to endorse an academic boycott of Israel. And the other thing that we've been doing is rank and file members at different branches have started to pass boycott motions at their branches. So, for example, in May, a strong boycott motion was passed at Sydney University, and then we've had, flowing on from that, boycott motions being passed at UNSW, at UTS, at Melbourne University, and there's been other actions taken at RMIT and the TRO. So, the rank and file has been trying to do a lot. Now, at the bureaucracy level, um, there's been some small things that the, the NTU has done. So they um, put out a statement in May of this year um, calling for a, a ceasefire. 
um, and they did call on universities to cut ties with the Israeli military. But, you know, some of us felt, felt it didn't go far enough um, because it didn't explicitly call for a boycott. It didn't identify Israel as the perpetrator of the genocide and it didn't identify the destruction of Gaza universities as a scholasticide. So to answer your question in, in brief, the bureaucracy has made some small steps, um, but it was really up to the, the rank and file to really push this a bit harder. And we were able to um, push to the extent where there were enough members on board that we were able to pass this boycott motion at National Council, which means now that the national policy of the NTU is one that supports an academic boycott. And not only that, this um, motion that we passed also calls for universities to cut ties with militaries. That's, um, you know, it's just, certainly it seems uh, it's, it's usually the case that unions have to be a bit, you know, the union leadership has to be dragged by its rank and file members. Um, but it's, I think it's quite um, historic that, in fact, I don't think any other union so far has managed to achieve a, uh, an official boycott motion like this. Uh, but could you explain a bit about what an academic institutional boycott really actually means in, in practice? Yeah, just before I do, just um, to let you know that this boycott motion at the NTU has been something that members have been trying to get through for decades. So it is, it is historic and we have finally got to the point now where the, the union executive actually voted for it. So that's that's quite an achievement. Um, so institutional academic boycott. Okay, so this this means that you we will um, in as a capacity as an institution. So I'm at Sydney University. So this means that we oppose any institutional level agreements and collaboration between our university and Israeli universities. It means that we would not collaborate academically with the leaders of Israeli universities. So that means people like deans and presidents. It also means we won't attend conferences or other events officially sponsored by Israeli university. Um, it means we will not collaborate with Israeli universities as institutions. Now, there is a caveat here um, where it is okay to collaborate with an individual academic who is Israeli, but if they represent their institution and if the funding is coming from that institution, then you can't collaborate on them. So just to clarify that last point, um, Let's say you're a, a researcher, you know, I, I don't know, a biology, a biology researcher, and, you know, there's a biology researcher in an Israeli university that has done some work that you want to cite or, you know, expand upon. Does that mean because that other researcher is, you know, employed and funded by the university they work for that you, that the researcher here wouldn't be able to collaborate with them? No, it doesn't. You can still collaborate with that person as an individual, in your individual capacity, so you can cite their work and you can work together. But what you can't do is accept money from that Israeli institution to fund that project you're working on. Um, the, the thing is, you know, it, it comes also down to a thing where it, if you're in academia, you'll know that academics boycott other academics all the time based on other reasons like disagreements with ideas or the way the direction of discipline is taking. So it's not like this is um, super radical in any way, but it is one thing we can do as university workers, as institutions, to say we're not going to tolerate working with Israeli institutions because of their role in and their complicity in genocide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 
the the union also, also organized a national day of action for palestine on october 23rd now i um unfortunately i was going to go to the one here in perth but i missed it uh what did this national day of action involve yeah so this national day of action was actually called initially by the rank and file group mteu for palestine and what we did was we took this proposal to the national council and got the National Day of Action endorsed by the National Council. So it was now endorsed nationally. So that helped us build momentum for the event. So what it was is that across many campuses, about 10 or 11 campuses were involved on the day. Um, there were rallies, there were speak outs, there were vigils, there was a couple of film screenings and a couple of Zoom and live talks as well. So there was some banner drops. Now, at different universities, we had different different capacity to do action. So at Sydney University, we had about 100 people, including students take part in the action. At other universities, they had similar events, but at some universities, they had smaller things like a Zoom for so the idea is that, you know, we're trying to mobilise support for Palestine amongst the members. The idea is to get, get us momentum, get us to the position where we have confidence as workers to start to implement the academic boycott. So it was really also to say it was really great grassroots action that happened nationally and it is really good to see like academics, university staff and students coming together. The other thing that happened on the day is that it was also co-organised with the National Union of Students and BDS Youth, who also called a national student strike for the same day. So there was a really great coming together of students and staff in solidarity with Palestine. Yeah, I saw... Um... Uh, obviously, only my neck of the woods in Perth. I saw there was a um a stu student action during the day in the in the city that was quite good. I saw some of the footage of that, and uh, I've heard from some of the people that went to the panel that it was is was really good. There was um representatives from various students for Palestine groups, uh, Murdoch University, uh, an academic from Murdoch that um actually has um Middle East and Palestine relations as a primary field of study. So I um. Uh, unfortunately, I missed that, but uh, I've heard it was was really great. I'm sure it was really good across the rest of the country as well. Um, on a side note, could you talk a little bit about the motion from the National Council uh, meeting that opposed Labor's attacks on the CFMEU and how that uh, kind of relates to the rest of the motions? Yeah, so basically... The Labor government has come out with this extremely draconian um, administration um, that they want to put the CFMEU into administration. So they forced the construction division into administration. And as workers and as unionists in the NTEU, um, we see this as a massive threat to all unionists, as well as being draconian and totally unfair and undemocratic. And we also wanted to criticise the role of the ACTU in this. So there was a lot of consensus around amongst councillors that we needed to do something and there'd be discussions at the division and state level about this before the National Council. Um, and so basically what was passed at the National Council meeting was um, a motion opposing the administrative measures imposed by the ALP government. And we affirmed, um, you know, things like the need for union democracy, for worker-led democracy, and we want that to be defended and restored in the CFMEU. The motion did also say 
that we have a zero tolerance approach to any corrupt or criminal influence within the movement. Um, and, you know, we also really wanted to stress that membership-based organisations um, should not have their democratic control externally removed by the state on the basis of untested allegations of criminality. You know, that sets a really dangerous precedent. So yeah. that's basically the um, the motion. And we also, you know, express solidarity with the FMEU members and we encouraged NTU members to participate in any solidarity actions happening in their respective um, states. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something we've covered uh, on the podcast in the past and we'll probably continue to cover here. Obviously, the, the attacks on the CFME are one of the worst attacks on unions in, you know, since at least the, the Bob Hawke Accords, if not further back. Um, and, you know, if, if they can come after one union, they can come after the rest of them. So it's glad, it's good to see that uh, at the very least that self-preserving logic, if not hopefully a bit of um, genuine solidarity as well, uh, is prevailing in the union. Um, yeah, I mean, just to say on that point that, um, a lot of the rank and file members, including myself, did want a bit more stronger wording in that motion um, because we did want to, you know, more clearly instruct our executive of the NTU to oppose the CFMEU at future ACTU meetings. Um, so because, unfortunately, what happened at that executive level was that they sort of kowtowed to the ACTU's decision. So that's just something to bear in mind that, you know, a lot of the members wanted even a, a stronger motion. Uh, so going back to just uh, the university sector in general and higher education, um, I think most of us know that higher education at the moment is in crisis, uh, particularly since COVID, uh, but even before then there were signs of it. Uh, many universities are attempt attempting to implement very harsh job cuts and higher workloads on its staff members, as well as a lot of casualization. I mean, I, I used to work for the for my sins, uh, the HR department of a university here, which I won't name, and I saw just how corporatized and uh, merciless uh, the the administration really was. Um, how is the NTU fighting back against this? Well, you're right that the sector's been in crisis for a long time and it's it's not getting any better soon. There's been massive job cuts. People, people probably seen in the media massive cuts at ANU University and at Macquarie um, as well as at Newcastle, at JCU. Not yet at Sydney, but that's in the works. So what the NTU is doing, so at Macquarie University, um, there's been mobilisation of staff to put a no confidence vote up in the Executive Dean of Arts. Okay, so it's quite a, a, a big step because what was happening there is that the Dean of Arts was planning to scrap, you know, hundreds of academic casual roles um, and also do some... Um, so draconian restrictions on staff's ability to take long service leave. Um, really worrying for Indigenous staff was that Macquarie also wanted to really strip back the Department of Critical Indigenous Studies, and they wanted to take they want to take it, its um, status as a department away. And, and turning into a discipline, that means it would um, lose its independence and, and financial autonomy as a department. And we actually at the National Council had an emergency motion on this and we pledged to fight against it. Um, you know, it's it's outrageous that a university in 2024 wants to strip away a Indigenous department. Um, so that's at Macquarie. And, at ANU, um, where, you know, there, there may be up to 600 job losses, which is uh, outrageous. 
and doubly outrageous the management there um, have asked staff to forego an already agreed upon pay rise of 2.5% in December, you know, shameful. So NTU members held a big rally on October 16th and they've also called for um, the Chancellor of ANU, who is Julie Bishop, um, they've called on her to resign. So, you know, that's one really tangible thing that's happening there. Um, more broadly, um, the NTU is calling for an urgent federal parliamentary inquiry into university governance. Because what's happening, as you can sort of tell by what I've said, is that at all these universities, the vice chancellors and the chancellors who are on outrageously huge salaries are making awful decisions which are, you know, ruining people's careers and livelihoods and also diminishing the um, quality of education. So there's a problem with the governance. It's not the only problem, but the NTU does want a federal parliamentary inquiry into, you know, why is this happening? Why is the sector being led into a hole, basically? And do you think um, part of it is particularly like the stripping of Indigenous studies and um, similar kinds of fields is part of this kind of overall um, push towards uh, defunding, say, humanities and artsy kind of degrees and focusing purely on science and engineering and those kinds of things, um, you know, with this idea that, oh, well, you know, so-called artsy degrees don't get don't get people in jobs so they aren't worthwhile and so on and you know uh, science and engineering is what gets people working in our <laughs> on our nuclear submarine so that's what we want right um do you think it's it's part of that overall pattern or is there something else going on there yeah definitely i mean the universities have been run like a business you know for many years now and that's only increasing and you know humanities arts languages all that have being, you know, stripped away on an ongoing and more draconian ways, you know, yearly it seems. It's definitely the focus is the university needs to be a business who make money by getting students in the courses where we know they're going to make money for us as an institution rather than thinking about the quality of education or anything like that. There's also the factor that, um, you know, international students is a, is a big factor. So you, people would have heard about the proposed international student caps. Now, because governments have been funding universities less and less, the universities look to international students as a way of beefing up their funding, which has also meant that that has also negatively impacted on humanities courses because the courses that a lot of international students are more likely to want to join or attend or enroll in have been in the STEM subjects and in business. So it's it's a real big deal and I'm glad also you've brought up the nuclear submarines issue. Um, it's, it's the reality that there is a big push for our universities to become more and more militarised and for students to be encouraged to enrol in subjects to support that military-industrial complex. Um, there was even something like 4,000, I think it was, enrolments offered to students in South Australia to enrol in specific subjects in a kind of um, trajectory towards working for the military. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really uh, massive issue. And in fact, a lot of us who have been working in the BDS work on campus are also really pushing to demilitarize universities completely, get military funding out of universities because it really is having a completely destructive effect on education. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know how it is in um, other states, but certainly 
in West Australia, where the, you know, the nuclear submarines are primarily going to be based, I mean, I, I, I do a stall at Murdoch University every Thursday. And right next to us, often there's a careers expo with this big poster that says, what a wonderful career you can have in, in shipbuilding and manufacturing <laughs> for the weapons industry. And it's just, it's, it's so naked everywhere you look. What are the next steps for Palestine solidarity within the NTU and the union movement in general? Well, within the NTU, now that we have the national endorsement for, of a boycott position and we're also officially calling for that and we're officially calling for universities to cut ties with militaries, now we have to implement this. So this is going to be up to mostly the rank and file activists on the ground to work really hard in getting universities to divest from militaries actually implement the boycott. So that's going to mean more mobilisation, working with students as well, you know, doing whatever we can. And that's going to be tough. Okay, so I'm not going to lie about that. It's probably going to be tougher than getting this boycott motion passed at the national level, actually getting universities to do this. So that's the next step. It's, it's, it will happen, but, it, you know, it's not going to be easy. Within the union movement more generally, you know, I think we have to really respond to the calls from our colleagues in Palestine who are calling for us to escalate, escalate with boycotts, escalate with actions, do whatever we can in our areas, block votes, you know, keep putting the pressure on. Um, the union movement is, you know, under attack. You know, we've seen what's happened to the CFMEU, but not only that, like bosses in all industries are really throwing everything at the working class at the moment. And it is a, it is to do with Palestine because it's like any worker who speaks out is now, you know, faced with a lot more oppression than they did, you know, a few years ago. So we've got to keep fighting back and, you know, collective power is really the key here. And bringing more and more people into the movement is really important. Well, that's great. And it's exciting to hear that, you know, things are, you know, as hard as things are and as much work as there is ahead, things are moving in, in the right direction. Um, that's all the questions that I had. Was there anything else you'd like to, to add on? I think just, you know, to make people aware that, um, Every, if they don't know already, every university in Gaza has been destroyed um, and a lot of academics and university staff and students have been murdered by Israel. So this is a really serious attack. It's a scholasticide as well as a genocide. And, you know, doing things like the academic boycott and cutting ties with military is really a small thing we can do um, in the face of this atrocity. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mark Heller. Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Isaac. That's about all we've got time for on this episode of the Green Left News podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, as always, if you'd like to help us out and keep this podcast going, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Plans start from only $5 a month and it makes a huge difference to help us continue. Um, a special thanks to Sean Valenzuela or at Little Archer Beats for the music that you've heard in this podcast. Also point people to a few upcoming actions. Obviously get to your weekly and fortnightly Palestine rallies across the country. Um, but the big one that's coming up is in the climate movement is the People's Blockade of the world's largest coal port, which is in Wollabimba, Newcastle. Yeah, I wish I could be there. Yeah, that's going to be uh, a really good weekend. Well, it's actually a 10-day event. Um, I'll get the date up here. It's um, starting on the Tuesday, the 19th of November, and finishes on um, Thursday, the 28th. Um, but uh, the key dates is the weekend of Friday, the 22nd to Sunday, the 24th. So make sure you come down. The program has just been released and it looks really great. There's a lot of uh, musicians and artists performing. Um, 
spend hours out on the water kayaking and, and blocking any coal ships um, from coming through. Um, so that's going to be a really important uh, protest and uh, they're hoping to get 10,000 people over the 10 days. Uh, so definitely don't miss out if you're in New South Wales or able to make the trip from somewhere else. Um, come down and, and come say hi. We're going to have a green left stall. Uh, I'm going to be there. Unfortunately, Riley can't make it. And a whole bunch yeah, of other... Yeah, too far. It costs about $700 and I'm afraid yeah. I don't have that much. It's a long way from uh, Perth to, to Newcastle, but... Hopefully, um, I have I have heard though just um, just on that uh, you know not only does it sound like a great uh, action, um, but some of the the people involved in, in organising that you know some of our comrades talked a bit about how there's a lot of really kind of innovative modes of organising that's going on with the rising tide mm. organisation itself. So that would be you know for people that are really into the the guts of activism and organising and you know, that side of things. Um, I, re I really recommend going and actually participating in that and seeing how that's being done because there's um, you know a lot of innovation, a lot of you know people thinking about how do we do things a bit differently than we've done them in the past. Yeah, for sure. So check that out, risingtide.org.au. There's also links on the Greenleaf website and in the podcast description. Um, but yeah, we'll see you next week for another episode of the Greenleaf News Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye.